You're listening to the Cynic Radio Podcast. Now, your hosts, Igri and Cynic. You are listening to episode 19 of the Cynic Radio Podcast. On this week's show, we break down and review The Walking Dead's new best friends. I'm your host, Cynic. With me, as always, the funniest man on Twitter, Igri. And joining us, our good friends, Jules and Ryan. Firstly, we'd like to give a big thank you to The Walking Dead Friends and Family page. They have great content, a wonderful group of loyal fans, and they support this show. We are the Cynic Radio Podcast, and we believe friends don't let friends fight Winslow the weaponized walker with only a keyboard. Miss out on that latest viral video? Didn't see the most recent trailer for the next movie coming out? In the dark about what the biggest song in America is? We've got you covered. Every week we scour the internet and look for the latest and greatest. This is What's Up. So what's up for me this week is that GSP is back. So if you don't know who GSP is, he is arguably the greatest fighter in the history of mixed martial arts um, and the UFC. Uh, and he's one of the biggest, uh, biggest stars. Uh, if he's not the greatest fighter of all time, he's probably he's definitely in the top five. Um, and personally, for me, I would say he's one or, or one A at worst. Uh, and this is important for a number of reasons. Uh, he was retired for a couple of years. Uh, he's never lost. His, he hasn't lost his title. And he has avenged every one of his professional losses uh, throughout his career. Um, just to give some context, 2016 was probably the biggest year financially for the Ultimate Fighting Championships. In addition to selling the most pay-per-views, they were also bought for four billion dollars. And unfortunately for the new owners, um, they they faced a huge challenge this year with their five major stars um, having issues. Um, Anderson Silva can't sell a pay-per-view anymore because he's aged and really, you know, isn't as great as he used to be. Um, Conor McGregor, the biggest star in MMA right now, uh, wants time off and then he wants to go into boxing to fight Floyd Mayweather. Um, Ronda Rousey's star has fallen significantly. Um, there are questions of whether or not she'll ever fight again. Brock Lesnar's retired. Um, John Jones uh, can't seem to stay out of trouble. So the signing of GSP is huge because it gives them, brings back a legitimate star who is still in his prime. And, uh, um, the one good thing with him is that, you know, he's he's always training. He's always in great shape. He's still in his prime age. He's a smart person, smart fighter. So I think this is a huge deal for the UFC and a huge deal for any fans of MMA because he's one of the, the really the really good guys in the sport in addition to being um, a great fighter. And, I you know, I'm sure that the new owners backed up a truck full of money to bring him back because they're, they went from a position of having some legitimately huge crossover stars to now having, you know, nobody <laughs> right now. So, um um, yep, Flo- uh, Flo- GSP being back is what's up for me. What's up for me this week goes out to a Troy High School student in Ohio who spent six months making 1,300 heart-shaped Valentine's Day origami cards for every single person in the school. All the teachers, all the students, all the staff, everybody custom-made origami hearts with a handwritten message that says you are loved. The student went into the school, put them on every single locker before school started on Valentine's Day. This is the kind of message we need to be spreading. She put a message that said you are loved for everybody in the school. Such positivity in this world makes it a loving and wonderful place to live in, and I'm proud to be here. So whoever you are in Troy High School, Ohio, you are what's up. What's up for me this week is the Ziosk. It's a tabletop ordering tablet that can let you communicate directly with the kitchen. Now, my biggest pet peeve when I dine out is waiting to pay the bill once I'm done. I'm not much of a lingerer, but the ability to not only pay your bill at the table, but to split the check at the table for some of your cheaper friends is an amazing idea. You can also order appetizers, order drink refills. Is there anything that this device cannot do? I hope the tech catches on. For me, it's a game changer and extremely efficient. The Ziosk. That's what's up. My what's up this week is for the premiere of the sixth and final season of Girls on HBO. Say what you will about Lena Dunham. This girl brings it to every episode she's on and literally at times lets it all hang out. I started watching the show a few seasons back after binge watching a couple episodes. And I thought that based on the demographic, it wouldn't really be something I would like. But I actually was immediately taken in with everybody in the cast. The show had a lot to live up to for me because they were basically following in the footsteps of that powerhouse which was Sex in the City, but I believe it completely lived up to its potential. Lena Dunham really strikes a 
accord with being a 20-something woman and the struggles of coming of age in the new millennium. The show, of course, uh, is what sent Adam Driver into A-list status as Kylo Ren in Star Wars Force Awakens. And I do appreciate that despite his big movie career, he's maintained his role as Adam on this show through the final season and didn't kind of forget where he came from. His tortured relationship with Lena Dunham's uh, character, Hannah Horvath, is one of the main reasons I love this show. So I'm glad to see that he came back. The relationship with all the women is so relatable for every woman in a different way than Carrie's relationships were in Sex and the City because those relationships were made in adulthood and they were established. The relationships in Girls on HBO is different because they're ones you make when you're young and in your 20s, they're the ones that you decide whether you want to keep it moving with these people or break it off. So final season of Girls on HBO. That's what's up. We're going to take some time today and uh, talk about episode 10 of The Walking Dead, New Best Friends. Ig, what was your initial uh, thoughts on the episode? Uh, well, initially, I thought that these were going to be, you know, friendly, smiley, happy people with fucking rainbows and unicorns and bringing people in and we're going to be happy. And they're going to have like Thanksgiving feasts and stuff because I was like, New Best Friends, hey, they're going to feed them. They're going to give them back massages, all kinds of good stuff, but uh, ended up not quite being that way. I didn't love it as much as I liked last week's. I thought that it left me a little hanging, but um, I felt validated that my opinion on why Rick was smiling was pretty much spot on. I was underwhelmed. I think there's some stuff to like about it. I did like the the new group as illogical as they are. They were kind of cool. I liked their leader. You know, so there's some stuff that obviously we'll get to that I did enjoy, but there was it was just it was still a little bit. I don't know. It just didn't hit me. Kind of like last week. It was just a little, I was just underwhelmed. And then the the just awful green screen just completely took me out of it for the rest of the episode. And anytime I think about the episode, I think about terrible green screen. And I am totally ready for some Negan in my life. Me too. It's been too long. I need some Negan. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's done purposely because of the saturation point. We opened the episode uh, with a little bit of bow and arrow action. It seems like the kingdom has been the first to really adopt this premise. Uh, and they're waiting for the saviors to show up uh, for yet another delivery because th- this is such a great arrangement for them. It gives this real f- uh, foreshadowing in another season or two. Uh, are we going to see guns gone? Uh, is everybody going to adopt what the kingdoms already kind of saw? Well, the thing is, is again, it's a finite resource unless they start s- spreading out their search area. And I mean, really spreading out their search area, moving to other states starting to trek across the country like voyageurs, you're going to run out of bullets. And even with Eugene, who knows how to make bullets, you know, you can only reload a case so many times until it becomes unusable. It, it turns into a problem where, you know, there is wood and you can use wood to make arrows. It is a an expendable resource and a renewable resource. And it's quiet. You know, you can be firing arrows from somewhere and nobody knows. You fire a gun. All the walkers know. All the other people know. It happens. You fire an arrow. Nobody knows until it hits somebody. Yeah, the smart choice, and even the saviors have kind of showed that, is the melee weapon. However, the the bow and arrow, it's kind of the the in between. So, Jules, how many how many more seasons do you think we get of the, the cool picture of Rick holding his gun before it's Rick holding the bow and arrow? Egg is right that I was wondering that actually in this episode when they were talking about needing guns, they all seem to be relatively in a close proximity to each other, obviously, because they uh, meet up often. <laughs> but I mean, how far will they have to go out to keep getting guns? And it, it would definitely seem like it, you need to be heading into a, a different territory than the guns, because you're right, there's you're not going to have the bullets and everything that you're going to need after, especially after a couple of years. We cut to the the saviors finally showing up to get their stuff, and Richard and and Jared yet, uh, get into yet another scuffle. So a little bit of neat kind of action. We get to see Morgan's reflexes. We get to see that Benjamin the Patter one is, is kind of learning his way around the bow staff. But once again, King Ezekiel doesn't even speak up on Richard's behalf. He just allows him to uh, have his gun handed over to the saviors. How long do people like Richard stay on board with the King of Ezekiel if they just constantly keep bending a knee to the saviors? 
not much longer. I think it's something's got to give. And you even we even see throughout the episode that Richard is ready to make a change. He's he's trying to force Ezekiel's hand. At some point, they have to realize that you know as much as Ezekiel thinks he's doing what's in the best interest of the group. Uh, you know, Negan will just keep pushing, or you know, the the entire group will keep pushing and pushing the boundaries until you know they're they're left with nothing. So I think at some point, very soon, either they force Ezekiel's hand or they have to betray him in order to fight back. How about you, Julie? How long would you hang in? How long would you watch your leader just constantly side with the other group? Well, it depends on if I'm an aggressive person that, you know, am I just hanging out back at the kingdom growing crops? I mean, I guess they don't really know about what's going on anyway. But I, I guess uh, for as far as Richard goes, you know, especially seeing how he's being taunted by this guy and uh, Ezekiel's not really coming to his defense and I definitely see that. I, I don't think I would wait a, around too much longer. And, and obviously, Richard's been stockpiling, and he he's taken all he can take. So, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't be okay with my the person that I'm you know following not taking up for me. But then again, it's like, what's Ezekiel supposed to do? I mean, is he supposed to start a war with the saviors when only a few people know what's going on? My issue with the problem, though, is he doesn't even go, hey, how about you get your guy in line? I'll manage my guy. You manage your guy. You know, the the guy you're leading the saviors bunch, it, 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 he doesn't even bat an eye to him. He's like, all right, Richard, hand over your weapon. How about you, Ig? I know that you have a low tolerance for bullshit. How long would you put up with Ezekiel saying, hey, hand over your gun? The rub here is that there's a time and a place to deal with this. Now, I, I'm not sure, and I, and what we haven't been shown is Ezekiel talking to Richard somewhere else saying, I would love to tell you why I didn't say anything there, and I'm saying something to you now. The The trick is, is you know, if you start asserting yourself in front of the saviors who are obviously more armed at the time, Maybe you lose people that you don't need to lose. And maybe Ezekiel is playing the long game. Again, like feeding them the pigs that are fed with walkers and doing everything else they can do. They're, he's playing the long game and trying to get them comfortable so that he can get them out of their area so that he can catch them by surprise. But if he's not having that talk with Richard, that's I'm I would be real short-willed to be living on that. And, and I think that's what's happening because... You know, as we see later in the episode when Richard tries to pull Daryl and they're going to go run some ambushes, it really looks like Richard's had enough of this shit. Well, we see Morgan lose his staff, which we all know has major sentimental, uh, sentimental value to him since the cheesemaker made it. And it goes back to the, the whole you can't clear me thing or the whole you can't clear me episode. Ryan, do you think he'll ever get his staff back? Yeah, of course. I'm sure there'll be some kind of some battle and he'll get it back in a triumphant moment. Um, you know, they set that up and it's happened before. So I totally see him getting the staff back. Yeah. Well, if Rick can get his very specific gun back and not just end up with any random gun, he can get his very specific staff back because it is a very specific staff that he's notched and whittled and worked and rubbed with oil and done a number of things to I mean he's loved that than mo more than most men have ever loved themselves so he's he's gonna get his stick back I don't know what it's gonna take for him to get I mean it, I think that could be something that's definitely happens in the end of the season you know when he end up at a raid somehow and he's going to get it back. That's what I assume is going to happen. But I was kind of wondering if you guys thought it was sort of weird the way he was asking for it back when he was just... <laughs> I didn't Did think so. I, I I thought it fit the character. This is he's a polite guy. He's a you know, and, and it just shows you what a bunch of dicks the saviors are. Because right away, I believe the leader's name is Gavin, but I'm not 100 percent sure. But it just shows you like what dicks because he asked nicely, like, hey, can, I know I just smacked you with that thing, but can I have it back? It means something to me. And he's like, hey, can I kill this guy? You and know, then he, when he was like, read the room. Yeah. <laughs> well, that that's a direct line from uh, that's a direct line from Negan. So that maybe they all mm. actually are Negan. Yeah. On top of losing his valued stick and they come home directly and everyone's disappointed. Dad, Daryl uh, confronts him as soon as they get back. And Daryl tells Morgan, come on, man. You know, at what point do you get this? You know what they are. But Ig, does Mor does Morgan really know what the saviors are? No, I don't think he does. I think he's he's at a loss because he hasn't been there to witness the atrocities at their finest. He wasn't there to watch 
you know, uh, Glenn and Abraham take Lucille like a champ. They weren't, he wasn't there to see him like try and make Rick cut Carl's arm off. He didn't see all that. He he knows that there are people that take guns and then make people forage for them and stuff, but he doesn't see the brutality. He doesn't see how they're making it happen so so quickly, so fiercely, so angrily. So I think he's of the mind that there may still be a way to work together with them, and there obviously isn't. And I'm going to make a prediction. I think that He's going to get his staff back because I think he's going to pull a Jesus and somehow end up in the Savior's compound and just sneak around until he finds it. I don't know if he's got the stealth of the parkour, but we could uh, certainly I'd certainly like to see it. Ryan, do you think Morgan's opinion of the Saviors would be different if he saw the the lineup and the loss of, uh, like Ig said, Glenn and Abe and, and almost seeing uh, Carl's arm come off? I, it's tough because he's actually difficult to read. Uh, I would think that he would have a different opinion if he was there for it. But he, you know, you're never, never quite sure where he stands with anything. So I think that, um, not that, not that you're not quite sure where he stands, but he is thoughtful and he doesn't take action as quickly as you would expect or think. And he usually, but he does do the right thing. So I think if he thought that they were really in real danger that he would he would have a different opinion. I mean, I agree. I agree with what both of you have said. I do agree that Morgan seems to think things out is is very um, thoughtful about everything and and wants to take the most peaceful way out. But that night was very damaging and it was very brutal. And I don't think that's something that you can just ever forget or. You know, when you're watching the brutality that took place uh, with Abraham and Glenn and then and and like Egg said, you know, almost cutting off uh, Carl's arm and what Rick had to go through and watching Rick get just defeated. I think I think that would have made a difference. I definitely think that would have made a difference in how he saw things. The problem with Morgan as a character is he's kind of walking a fine line because I believe he thinks he believes that his principles are the only thing that are attached to his sanity. So if he loses those principles, he may uh, kind of skew back over to the way Rick found him the second time. And, you know, nobody wants that. Nobody wants to see that. Uh, they did a lot of that with the the comic book Morgan, where he kind of n- wasn't as insane, but stayed like in that fragile state for the, the majority of his run through the book. So I think he kind of plays it as if, you know, I've got to stay on this path, regardless of what you guys do, because I want to keep my mind. Richard and Daryl go out on a little bit of a field trip. Uh, He doesn't exactly tell Daryl the full extent of his plan until they kind of get out by the Smokey and the Bandit trailer, which was a a neat little Easter egg. Did you think that the big Carol reveal would have or should have took longer? Yeah, I do. I think it was it was rushed. And it may have been rushed because the audience was calling for it. It was sloppy. And I was not a fan of how they revealed it. And I'm not a fan of how they they let Glenn know. I would have much rather just had it happen organically. And it was I didn't like it at all. Yeah, I kind of agree. I agree with it uh, to an extent. I don't think it was I was actually more disappointed or again, underwhelmed by the actual meeting, but him finding out, I think maybe they thought they were a little too clever for their own good. Um, you know, as how they were going to bring it up. It was a little convoluted. Like that whole, the, the whole thing was just a little convoluted. I under, I get, I get his reasoning, but there were far better ways and easier ways and, and less risky ways to get Ezekiel. If you want, you know, go kill her and make it look like it's the, it's the, it's the saviors. If you really want that, I don't know. Plan. It seemed too much just to get Daryl to kind of figure, piece it together that it must be Carol. So, you know, I agree. It wasn't, it wasn't really well done. Um, I was again, underwhelmed by that scene, but again, more so by the actual meeting between Carol and Daryl. I wasn't sure if I wanted Richard to say a different name when when he was like, who, what is her name? I was like, you know, I was kind of pondering if he was going to say a different name and if I wanted there to be a little bit of a longer time before they saw each other. I was happy to see them see each other. I definitely agree. That was exciting. But this has been a, um, a buildup that we've been waiting for. And I agree it was just a little bit too soon. It could have it could have been a little bit more drawn out. Other than him realizing that she's out there and then 
immediately showing up at her door. I don't know that it was too soon because they've been they've been apart for so such a long time, kind of in a, in the viewer's mind at least, or at least from watching the episodes. But they didn't really plant any seeds. Like typically, you know, you get a couple seeds planted. Maybe there's like a mist. They miss each other by a, you know a few minutes, and they're you know the seeds kind of get planted. But it went from like zero to you know a hundred right away so I think that was it too is we didn't have time to let that like build the anticipation and and allow that to build and give it room to breathe so I think that's also part of why it just didn't feel right felt a little rushed and because how long has he been at the kingdom like 20 minutes and then he's like you know it would have been nice for him maybe to have been there for a little while and then been like what she's been here you know right around the corner from me all along instead he just got there and he's like oh cool she's here too you know and and also maybe a couple of hints because, yeah, it was like, you know, they've been away for a long time. And so it was, it's been built in our minds like, wow, they're going to have a reunion. But they just they didn't give us anything. It was just like, all right, they're back together, you know, rather than giving it some some bit of like, you know, some hints and make us you know excited. You know, again, a misconnection. almost It almost happens and it doesn't. And at least let it build a little bit. Um, maybe a couple clues that he gets and he starts wondering and asking questions. But, yeah, we just got like right away there together. And again, underwhelming. Well, it's much flatter as they get for uh, dragging things out. It's hard to say The Walking Dead rushed anything, but this did feel a little rushed to me too. It really could have been uh, a middle of the run episode where, you know, they keep missing each other or uh, Daryl finds uh, some clues or even they're both kind of wandering through the woods and they kind of get the drop on each other, much like uh, it was with her and Benjamin. I I I foresaw it going a different way. I was kind of a, a big fan of the meeting when they finally did get together, but the, the way it was revealed was it, it was a little strange. And I really didn't think Richard's plan spoke to his character. Like it, it seemed way too seedy and way too underhanded and way too dark. I had a, I had a little bit of a problem with that. If the fight went on, if it would have continued, which, you know, Daryl was always kind of slow to put hands on anybody. Who do you think would have won? Well, you know, the the trick is they, they got further along and then it's gun versus crossbow. And as much as crossbows are good and as good as Daryl is with stuff, bullets do travel faster than arrows. I'm not sure either one of them was really prepared to kill the other one. But if one was more prepared than the other, that would have been Daryl. So all things being what they are, I'm going to have to side with Daryl and think that Daryl would have probably won because he's more willing to pull the trigger on somebody, especially somebody that's going to hurt his bestie, Carol. Yeah, Ryan, if they were in the octagon, who would have got the upper hand in that bout? <laughs> no weapons? I think Daryl definitely gets the upper hand. Um, uh, but but as Ig said, if, if they've got yeah, gun to crossbow, it, it's no not really a challenge. So I think... Uh, yeah, I think uh, Richard wins if they've got their weapons or at the end of that battle. But yeah, in the Octagon, I definitely would I would go with Daryl, especially this angry Daryl who doesn't seem to care as much about life. So uh, yeah, I would give the edge to Daryl hand to hand. Yeah, post Easy Street Daryl is definitely a force to be reckoned with. Julian, in your opinion, do you think there's anyone Daryl wouldn't kill if it meant saving Carol? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I don't think he would kill. Uh, I, I want to say Rick. I don't think he would kill Rick. I don't know. That would be, that's a hard one. I'm thinking it might just stop and start at Rick. (laughs) If anyone, that's the only person I could really see that would, you know, he would have to sit for a minute. Everyone else I see, I think he would impulsively just kill. See, I think he's had his, his bouts with Rick where I think Rick is expendable to Daryl. Really? Uh, Maybe, maybe Judith. Maybe he wouldn't kill you. you. The only one left is a little ass kicker. (laughs) I mean, like, you saw when Rick and Daryl were were reunited. I mean, I felt like that. I don't know. I feel like that had the same tone as him being reunited with Carol. I, I, I don't know. I would definitely have to think about that one. I think the tone was a little different because I think it was more of a. You know, I don't want to say like they're they're equals. I want to say that Carol is almost more of a mother figure to Daryl. Yeah, I definitely felt that on this episode for sure. It was clear. We saw a little bit of this last episode, but the the garbage pail kids or the heapsters or any number of names that they've been given, they move like a colony of ants, which all apparently shopped at Hot Topic pre breakout, and they all talk like hipsters. What was your impressions of the junkyard? 
the junkyard itself, the junkyard itself is very cool. It's a maze. It's if you know where you're going in there, you could probably move around there very efficiently. But if you don't, you'd get lost, and that's where they get you. I think that they needed to to bring in some more people in their community. I think they needed some fashion advisors and hairdressers because they all look like a hot mess. Uh, maybe some language experts because uh, Nell is really having some party on the tata. What do you think, Joel? Do you think that there should have been subtitles for what the hipsters were saying? I think we could hear what they were saying. It just seemed so ridiculous. It, I just felt like they it it felt very out of place it, to think that they had to create a whole type of language after only a couple of years. I, I'm not sure how long it's been since this all sort of took place, but we know it's been only a couple of years. I don't think you're going to have a whole language you need to create or or just talk and uh, you know truncated sentences. <laughs> <laughs> so at first I thought it was I thought definitely thought it was weird. I like you know I like any new characters and I definitely liked the you know kind of it was the language is interesting. Yeah, they they, they kind of dress ridiculous. Um, the concept behind their kind of that maze is is really cool and it makes sense in that world that that that's how you a way to protect yourself. The one thing I did realize is you know okay if you have a group of people that look at Ezekiel as a king, why can't you have a group that that is strange and speaks like talk speaks a weird language uh, you know if you have a, a strong enough i guess leader um it's like any other cult and they'll follow that leader especially in a world where everybody is so vulnerable so i didn't you know initially i thought okay this is ridiculous it's so it hasn't been long enough for a group of people to develop their own language but if you think about it it's like yeah they're all scared they're vulnerable they have to live in this brand new world and survive a world that's just completely been turned upside down so if you get a couple one or two strong leaders who for whatever reason decides, yeah, I'm going to create a cult that we just speak in weird, oh, in short sentences and and dress weird. Yeah, I could see people following that pretty quickly if if they're going to be safe. Egan and I had a conversation before about how we would last exactly two days in that community, even though I dress similar to what they do. The first time someone said up, up, up to me, I'd be like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> right. why, why do you keep saying that? It, you know, they went up there. You know, <laughs> I, I would instantly be drummed out of their community and I would probably make fun of the uh, the bang cut that the leader had. On the way out, on the way in, all the way around, be like... What is wrong with your hair, lady? Rick's pleas for help uh, to fight against the saviors and join us was met with bemusement from Jadis. Rick took the tactic that you don't own our lives, the saviors own our lives, and if you kill us, then they're eventually come uh, going to come looking. Julie, would you have taken that same tactic in that argument if that was you? I think he didn't feel threatened by them at all. He did, to me, seem amused almost where he was dealing with them. It was like, okay, you guys are small potatoes here. What 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 what, what, what do you want from me? What what do we need to discuss? <laughs> it he didn't strike me as the least bit scared or the least bit threatened. Like he has, uh, we've seen him be beaten down by Negan. I'll I'll, I'll play along with you. I'll you know, but we're going to all see the same. Thing at the end of this. I think it was a perfect plan to stroke the ego of the people that were there. It, what it did was it, is it allowed them to believe that they were still in a position of power, but that they couldn't necessarily control them, but that they could leverage their power against everything that our, our faithful superheroes are doing. That being said, I think that he could have gone a couple of different directions with it, um, allowing and not trying to find a way to shut down his groups lashing out at the Garbage Pail Kids. That that might have helped his case further. Maybe he wouldn't have had to go to the up, up, up. I, I don't know. I, th- I, think it, I think it worked. I think it worked to say they own our lives, you don't. It, 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 was, a, it was a very complex thing that I think worked very well. Once again, we see Rosita escalate a situation, which in return starts a bit of a melee and Father Gabriel steps up to fix it. At what point, Ryan, does her hostility become uh, detrimental to the group where she becomes a liability? Soon. It's it's already been detrimental in a number, in a, a number of times. I mean, she nearly killed Negan and, you know, because she didn't complete the job, you know, led to other deaths and and very well sh- could have and should have led to hers. Um, you have situations like this, like I think she's become unhinged and it does be it does become problematic because this isn't, you know, at least th- this world is not one where you can make many mistakes. And she's made a few, you know, over the over the season that really should have cost her and many other people their lives, especially, you know, seeing how brutal um, some of these people can be. 
yeah, that melee could have went wrong in a lot of ways. Jules, at what point does Rick say, all right, maybe he should put Rosita in a timeout? Yeah, he's going to have to do that soon because like Ryan said, you know, uh, she's it's she's responsible for them losing Eugene, the the person that's least able to handle whatever is going to happen to him at the Savior compound. So she should have been uh, put in her place right after that. But she definitely has such a huge chip on her shoulder that she's going to need to be brought down some. But obviously now Rick knows she has some worth due to the dynamite situation. But yeah, she definitely needs to take it down. IG being a father yourself, how would you handle this Rosita situation? Oh, you know, last week I spoke a lot about how Rosita just redeemed herself almost completely with how she handled all those explosives. And then she goes and does this. You know, this is just like being a father too, because, you know, your kids finally do something really good and they're showing some light at the end of the tunnel and then they revert right back to being an idiot. And you just want to look at them and go, yeah, I was calling you dumbass for all those years for a reason. I'll put you through so, a goddamn wall. <laughs> man, why, can't you just shut up and do your, your one useful thing? Oh, I spoke so many volumes last week about how, how good she was doing and how important it was that she could do this stuff. And then she's there starting trouble with the new best friends. And come on. Can't can't you just get along? Just just fall in line just this one time. I know that you feel like you need to assert yourself at every turn, but all she's she's literally trying to cause problems. Like like they said, you know, getting people killed back in Alexandria, getting Eugene taken, all these problems she's caused repeatedly, and now and now she finally gets a little bit of redemption, and then. Pfft, no, nah, come on. There were two really big, great visual scenes from the, the teaser trailers that we got pre this second half of the season. One was uh, Rick in the car, and it almost looked like they, they played it off like he was racing somebody. The other was the, the weaponized walker. They bring Rick to the up, 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 push him down, and he ends up in the Rancor pit. And by the way, I wrote that before uh, before the Talking Dead so once again, screw you, Hardwick. Did his befuddlement, inability to act initially, did that ring true to the character to you, Ryan? Like, he seemed almost a bit confused on how to handle the situation. Was it the fall or was it the writing that was kind of flawed there? I don't know that it was a... F- I didn't see it as a flaw in the writing. I, You see, I... To me, like, Rick's still suffering PT- from PTSD. And he, he still being kind of he's controlled by his own hubris like I felt like even in this meeting while he did say the right thing as far as you know kind of planting that seed of that they should be afraid of the saviors if they're not already that the saviors own them and and that they'll own them too you know I I think you could still see the hubris build up again. You know, he's been broken down, but he's still building up to, but, but he, he doesn't have like a frame, that framework of, of his strength and of, of being successful or having recent success and of overcoming recent challenges. Like he hasn't done that. So in a way, this is just kind of a shock. I think it was a shock to him. And so I kind of his befuddlement to me was a little kind of rang true to, to where he is as a character. He's not back um, as much as I think he'd like to, you know, it, 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 he'd like to think he is. And so he needed a few minutes to kind of figure things out. So it, to me, it wasn't bad writing, but I, it actually might have been pretty good writing to have him not just immediately know exactly what to do. And he did need help. It would have definitely took some drama out of the situation. What do you think, Julie? Do you think the, the fall can be contributed to his inability to act or gauge of the situation? Or do you think it was bad writing? No, I agree with Ryan completely. I think, you know, he, I mean, he's standing there in the up, 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 and she threw him down, down, down. And I don't think he was ready for that. I think he was just standing there trying to, you know, take in everything that was, you know, he's smiling. He's like, okay, this is, and then she's talking and, and then she threw him down. So I think I think that was completely natural. And you're right. You're surrounded by garbage. You don't really have this is all a new area for him as far as, um, you know, I mean, what are you supposed to do um, as why are you throwing me down this? Like, Because he did obviously didn't see that uh, walker and initially. So she's just throwing him down this garbage pit. It's like, what's what's going on? What do I need to do here? So I, I don't think it was bad writing at all. How about you, Eek? Do you th- uh, and how hard did you laugh when the first weapon he went for was a keyboard? Keyboard. 
<laughs> you use the keyboard warrior. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I mean, first they take them to the up, up, up. The Garbage Pail Kids are poor sports at that point because they don't tell them, hey, we're about to play King of the Hill. They don't say go. And then they Rick roll him down the hill. <laughs> and then he's down there just looking around like, huh? Yeah. I think he might have hit his head on a couple of things on his way down there, which is why it's like, I'm going to hit you with a keyboard. <laughs> Whap. Ah, all right. Impale on the hand, everything. I think it was good writing. I think it was... A, a strange situation to find yourself in. I mean, nowhere yet have in the whole seven and a half or six and a half se- seasons of this show have we seen a weaponized walker. That guy was cool as shit. So I, I might be a little taken aback to, you know, it's like living in a can of fluffy bunnies and all of a sudden one comes out with body armor and spikes sticking out of it. That would be a little fucking strange. Especially since the walkers have kind of been minimized in the theme of the show. It's a, a numbers game rather more than them being a threat. You know, there needs to be a, a ton of walkers before they're a problem. This one was a problem on its own. He eventually overcomes Winslow with the help of Michonne's advice of using the walls and, and knocking them down around them. Do you think, Jules, that he would have lost the fight without her help? Um, no, I think that Rick is, you know, I think he's pretty resourceful. I think he just needed to g- get his bearings about him. I think he was a little bit thrown from being thrown down the hill. And I think he would have probably figured it out or found something. But I don't think it was, you know, great thanks for your help, Michonne. But I don't think it was going to make or break him in that scenario. The wound on his hand looked pretty serious and he was bleeding pretty heavily. I, in your opinion, do you think this could be the beginning of the end of our two handed Rick? Well, you know, the thing is, is the hand is a very resilient thing. If, if he didn't hit a major vascular thing inside of there, it's probably most likely that it can heal. And he may have like lifelong arthritis in it now, but for the, I mean, there'd been numerous occasions of people getting something plunged through their hand where, you know, you, you live, you, you're fine and the hand heals and you just have some achy, painy things going on in it. Uh, you know, I think the bigger problem might be, I don't know if they have any tetanus shots around or anything, so he might develop lockjaw and just walk around with his mouth agape all the time. What do you think, uh, Ryan? Because they keep teasing it. They keep te- I mean, when he went to cut Carl's arms off, uh, or, or hand off, he said, no, cut mine off. Now he's got a wound to his heel. Uh, he just keeps teasing it. Do you think that we eventually see a one-handed Rick? Maybe. I mean, the... the- as far as I know, that's in the comics, right? He, he loses yes. his arm in the comics. So maybe it's just they're having fun with it and teasing it. It was a little strange. And I, you know, I, that's my, I was, that was my first thought is, wow, that is that going to get infected? Is that how they're going to cut the arm off? Or is, is that how he loses it? So, yeah, may, I, you know, I, I don't think they will because it limits them as far as, you know, d- then he just has to ha- either they're going to have to use extra CGI or they have to put something on his arm like Merle or, or do something to, to at least uh, mask it. But I feel like we'll continue to have a two armed Rick. That's just my, my thought, but that's a great way to get rid of it. If they, again, he's got a bad, badly infected arm. Um, you know, my other thought was, but I guess they won't go that route as if it was infected, like zombie infected, then they, but th- if they thought that they would immediately cut it off. Um, but, uh, so, yeah, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how they go about it the next couple of weeks or if he just miraculously has a functioning hand with like they'll put a wrap around it and it'll function perfectly for the rest of the season. And then next year, everything will be fine. The Walking Dead and Greg Nicotero have a long history of great visual gags, almost a visual, you know, visually, they've always been on par as far as everything they've done. The the Walker kills, the the explosions, the everything. Did the show fall further than Rick down the trash heap with that terrible green screen, Ryan? <laughs> that. You know, it's like one of those things that one little thing will will just piss you off for the rest of the the show. And I just couldn't get over it. It was just like, because it was like, how does that get past... Whoever whoever's watching it, you know, how does that get past the the director of the episode? How does it get past the editor? How does it get past you know showrunners or whoever's watching it, you know, viewing it prior to it being released? Like, how does that get past anybody? And they say, you know, I'm okay with that. It was just it was terrible, and like the smile was terrible. I mean, it just made me think this is this is like, yeah, you I. It's been 20 years since I've seen a movie with that bad, like, or show with, 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 um, a green screen that bad. Like there's so many other ways they could have gone about it if they, if they really needed that scene. And and that was just awful. I I was watching the show live as it was airing and all of a sudden he was standing there and I was waiting for like, you know, a, a Pegasus or something to fly by and 
a TIE fighter. I don't know. It was just like, what is going on there? I mean, it just was odd. Because, I mean, in the following shots, you see him up there with the Garbage Pail Kids. So, like, he was there when they filmed it. And all of a sudden, they have this just... Was was there like somebody behind him flipping the bird or something? They needed to cut it out or bunny I mean, ears. Was, I'm going with bunny ears. Somebody did bunny ears. They bunny had to cut ears. it. I mean, it was awful, just awful green screen use. And uh, we we live tweet this show, everybody. So you can go check out our Twitter at Cynic Radio and go see. We mentioned this when it happened. It was, I mean, it was so apparent that 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 right onto the Twitter feed. Oh my god. That it was, I don't know as I have ever seen green screen use that bad, and I mean in anything. And I've seen some pretty campy movies, some pretty bad green screen use. That was, it was so out of place because I mean the rest of the episode visually was was there. It worked. Everything was set up nice. All the composition was good. The camera shots were good. And then all of a sudden, there's this glaring thing. There's out in the middle, like. You know, they may as well have had him had buck teeth and a mohawk or something, because he was just... Once Rick overcomes Winslow, thanks a lot, Gabriel, for that, by the way, with this whole Rick can do anything speech. Jadis and Rick negotiate half of, uh, half of what they took from Alexandra, a third of what they win from the Saviors, and guns, a lot of them. She also revealed that they've been watching the boat for a very long time, waiting for someone to come along and get supplies from them. Ig, what... Did that conversation between Rick and and Jadis tell you about Jadis's character? It told me that she likes Looney Tunes a lot, because um, she that reminded me of uh, Daffy Duck and Bugs Bunny going duck season, rabbit season, duck season, rabbit season. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and it also told me that that she knows what she's doing. She knows that. They need things because she she was talking earlier about how they were opening cans and sometimes the cans already had spoiled food in them because the stuff was so old. She knows that she needs to get things to keep her community going. So just like every other leader of every other community that we've seen here, she knows what's needed for her people. So it also showed me that she does care about what happens to her people. She knows that they're strong and she knows that they have ways to get things done. But what they've been doing so far isn't sufficient to keep them going. So she's using Rick's team to help get them to continue. And Rick is using them to help have some extra firepower. It's a mutually beneficial relationship as far as I can tell. She did show some uh, that she's very savvy, that she's in charge for a reason. And it also showed uh, that Rick is on his way back as far as being confident because he wasn't desperate enough to just take any deal. You know, because he realizes a third has got to, another third of that has got to go between the to the hilltop and the kingdom. So he wasn't willing to just sell the farm to to win the battle. Well, I I it shows obviously she has patience if she's been sitting around waiting for people to get on that boat to get those supplies. But then I guess I also wonder how aggressive they will be if um, you know they never actually made any attempts to do that on their own. They just kind of sat around waiting for somebody else to do it. Well, they explained that. They they explained that. So there's the thing. They they said, you know, we take, we don't bother. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay, okay, you're right on that. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think that the, I think it'll be, they have a lot of people um, with Jadis's group. So I think that it's going to be, I think they both showed they were strong leaders. They were both standing their ground, but they were both willing to compromise and they both came out of it happy. So I think this is a great step in the right direction. Yeah, I agree. I don't have much to add. I think it was, you know, they were both negotiating, um, you know, each with their own strength. She had, they have the numbers. They've, they've essentially got Rick hostage at this point. And um, he obviously knows more about maybe what's going on and, and, an ability to get supplies that they they maybe don't have um, or they'd rather him do their bidding. So I think they both are negotiating with their own specific advantages and, uh, you know, they both did a good job of kind of compromising and neither one trying to push the issue too much or too far. I had a question, though, because um, when she was like, we need guns, we need guns, and that was sort of the last thing they said to them, uh, we need guns or else... They needed guns, obviously, 
before they met the garbage pail kids, but they were not getting them as as much so like they had um, Rosita having Eugene make a bullet because they were so low on all this. Now, the way they were talking, it sort of seems like, oh, yeah, well, we're going to get these guns. We're going to go get some. So I don't know if it's just that they had been under the cower of that fear of ne- Negan and and they haven't been able to move on. And and now all of a sudden Rick is getting his mojo back. So now it's seeming to be more of an attainable thing. But I am kind of wondering how far out they're going to have to go to get the amount of guns they're looking for. Because of the knowledge of Rick and his group in the hilltop and everything and, and the frequency of the saviors coming to visit, having guns puts them at a disadvantage, but the saviors don't know about the Garbage Pail Kids. They don't know they exist. So putting guns in the hands of the Garbage Pail Kids doesn't hurt your position where you're at until you're ready to strike. It it is a, a very beneficial thing to give them a bunch of guns, even more than they can carry because or more than they can use at a single time. Because then when you join up with them to go and attack something, if they hand you some guns and everybody's shooting and then you give them the guns back to wait for the next fight, you're you're ready to go. So the guns are something that could work. Um, Again, we go back to earlier in the episode with the bows and arrows. You know, if you learn to craft some bows and arrows, I mean... Especially the arrows. Bows are a little harder to craft. The strings are very specific in how, how you need some tensile strength. And the you can't just take any piece of wood and put a string on it and make it a bow. So it is tricky. But, again, renewable resources. Well, and that leads me to my next question. Ryan, do you think that this group and Jadis are trustworthy? Uh, yeah, I think so. They seemed fairly straight. Once you understood their their language and the dress and their kind of community, I I do think they're trustworthy, or at least they seem so. Um, going back to the, just one of this comment, one thing I which I that scene at the end where there was a, you know because like Tara, you've been out further than anyone. You must know something like that. Obviously, was a I didn't like that. It was just so kind of shoehorned in. And like, I do wonder, like, how does how does that other group fit in? Do they does she finally tell them and do they go and just try to steal the guns or do they try to bring them on board? Because obviously they have a stockpile of weapons um, and, you know, and the uh, and the scavengers need a stockpile of weapons. So it just, you know, it makes sense that there would be some kind of a conflict or or at least some in- interaction with that group. I didn't love that scene. <laughs> I thought, it was, again, it was shoehorned in. But um, but yeah, it's in- it makes it interesting. So they're they're, ob- they're is a large cache of weapons that somebody in the group knows about. So I wonder how that connects to the larger Egyptian, plot. Your Honor, leading the plot point. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing, you know, trusting them. I, I'm at the point right now in this whole series where I'm not even sure I trust Alexandria, Hilltop, or the Kingdom. Somehow, I mean, we have been thrown for enough loops with any of these places that they've ended up that it it's it just messes with me every time it's like okay with well, these people are trustworthy and all of a sudden nope they're not i'm waiting for the other shoe to drop but means to an end sometimes you use somebody that isn't the greatest for what you're doing because they're worse for the other guys than they are for you the the old adage the enemy of my enemy is my friend it might be leading that way. Maybe you don't have to trust them completely. Maybe you give them guns and no bullets. <laughs> he's gotten further than um, with these the garbage pail kids than he's gotten with uh, Alexandria and the Hilltop. You know, those guys said no to him. So, I mean, he's at least getting some recruits. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just going to say, I think as things are set up now, you can't trust anybody. You know, obviously any group is looking out for their own best interest. But as long as your partner that that is also you know you, that you have something of value to offer i think you can trust most of the groups you know at, at this stage it's only the communities that are like everything is perfect and we have no problems that's when you you have to wor- you know you have to worry you know uh, we saw with like terminus and we saw with um you know yeah, with the governor. So I think in this case, he can trust them as long as he's he's useful, as long as he's kind of uh, an instrument, uh, you know, for them to, you know, which, again, his skills are getting things. And so I think they can trust them to go after um, the saviors 
but then who, there's not that's not to say there wouldn't be a conflict down the road between them. It should be interesting, though, if it does lead to Tara revealing Seaside. Now, what are they going to have to give them to get the guns to give to the Garbage Pail Kids? It, maybe a group too many in, in, in the, the whole grand scheme of things. But once he gets these guys and maybe if he gets the, the, the women of Seaside, maybe you can get the kingdom and uh, and Hilltop to join on board. Richard was kind of on mark, even though how kind of terrible his plan was. He's on Mark. I think the only thing that drives King Ezekiel into this conflict is something tragic happened. And the only tragic things I can think of are Carol and Ben. So let's hope that doesn't go that way. Once again, the, uh, the people of the kingdom aren't uh, abiding by Carol's wishes. And she opens her door to find uh, King Ezekiel and a bunch of his guards standing outside. And Jerry the man brings her cobbler, which he's always good for. Do you think, uh, Jules, that the kingdom will ever be able to convince Carol to kind of embrace them and be one of their own? I don't think Carol really, I think Carol, it's either Carol is a part of Rick's group or Carol is alone. I don't really see her wanting to invest the time to get to know a whole nother group of people. I think she appreciates them and they're fine that, you know, to check on her, I guess. But even then she's made a tripwire, so maybe she doesn't want him checking on her. But I think that she definitely, I don't really ever see her being or desiring to be part of that kingdom because she would have probably stayed. I thought it was a great scene when Daryl shows up almost directly after and knocks on Carol's door. Melissa McBride, in my opinion at least, hit a homer as far as her reaction and her facial expression. I kind of felt the show rushed it a little bit, uh, cut away from it a little too quickly. I wanted to see more of the reunion, but we we jumped to something else. I believe we jumped back to Rick and the group at the dump. What did you feel about her acting, Jules? Oh, yeah. I mean, she brought it in this scene. I mean, for sure. She, I definitely felt a, I was uh, talking to you a little bit about this earlier. I know that Ryan had brought up uh, at one point a couple episodes ago about Carol and Daryl hooking up, maybe if they saw each other again. And I had never had a full feeling of them having that kind of relationship. I know there was a little implication here or there that it was like that, but obviously nothing was ever done. And this to me, solidified what I'd always thought about the relationship was that it was a very mother-son relationship. And I mean, I got the feels all over when I saw Daryl talking to Carol and being like, why did you leave? And it was, it was, that was touching. It was a touching scene. We cut from that to another, in my opinion, again, another fantastic scene between Seth Gilliam and uh, Andrew Lincoln. And the overall theme of it was, you know, Gabriel stepped up and uh, he asked Rick why you had so many, com- uh, why you smiled and you had so much confidence going into the situation. And he basically pointed to to Gabriel and said that you, uh, that someone showed me that enemies can become friends, referring to their past conflict. Ig, in your opinion, right now, is there a bigger believer in Rick besides Michonne than Gabriel? No, there isn't. Uh, Gabriel is has got full belief in Rick at this point, and especially because he left very simple clues behind and that led him very quickly to where they were going. So that being said, you know, it it does a little bit of good to have Rick have some believers, but it's going to do a whole lot more good if they all start working more as a team and stop. I mean, like Rosita doing her outlying things, they need to learn to be together and not doing their own thing because it seemed like Rosita was ready to go out and do I mean she said so she's like well I'll just go out on my own then you know no do this as a team you're going to get more done as a team than you are as an individual and that's how you're going to survive and thrive and make things happen and I don't know maybe Rosita has to die but then they don't have an explosive expert you know then they're just lobbing dynamite sticks at people and they forget to light them. I don't know. I mean, there's there's all kinds of fucking problems. And I'm hoping they get some form of resolution moving toward them. Like somebody sits her down and hits her with a yardstick on the knuckles or something. Because she's going to need to have some kind of come to Jesus meeting. Maybe Jesus will get it for her. I don't know. Uh, but yes, I'm so happy that Rick has the support of Gabriel. I think Rick having the support of Gabriel because Gabriel has so many other people's ears might help even further because Gabriel has counseled Rosita as well. So maybe Gabriel saying something to Rosita like, this is why I trust Rick. Maybe that'll bring things together. 
in the reverse of their unity meeting, we also see that friends can become enemies as Rosita and Tara, uh, Tara begin to argue about the way she's acting and uh, what her plans are going forward. She even throws a barb at Gabriel like, what are these? Uh, these your new friends now? Do you think this mindset ultimately, uh, Julie, is going to get Rosita killed? Um, yeah, I mean, it. I mean, I don't know if she's going to get killed, but I think that she's definitely... Um, She's not helping anything. She has got to turn this around. She's got to figure out how to find somebody, a person in this group that she trusts and she can feel connected to, um, to bring her back into the group. I do feel like she had a little bit of that relationship with Eugene, even though it was very, I feel like she was mean to him, but I feel like she did have that connection with him and then she's lost him too. So maybe getting back to him, saving him, something will bring her back, but she's got to get it together. What do you think, Ig? Do you think she's Walker bait or do you think she survives the season? I think she's going to survive the season, but I don't know if she's going to get through unscathed. I think it may become, she may find the error of her ways as it comes. I I would like to see her survive because I would like to see her character move back toward the stuff we saw last week because last week she was so impressive And we need more of that because, as we've said in past episodes, she's basically worthless, except for last episode. But if we get more of what was happening, then we'll we'll do miles better in the future. And the group will do miles better. I mean, she obviously has some smarts and wits about her where if you put her in the right place, she's formidable. So I think we need to make sure that we're moving forward and helping her realize her growth because she's got places to go. When it comes to that dynamite, her fuck it all to hell attitude really helps. <laughs> I think that she's she's too valuable now with her the explosives work to to die. Um, at the same time, I, you know, and then she's got this conflict with Sasha. So my, my thought is maybe there'll be some kind of resolution to their own kind of personal conflict maybe they'll become friends or at least res- there'll be a level of respect that once Sasha dies which she's got to die because she's the star of the the new Star Trek um, series once Sasha dies Rosita will somehow be responsible for the death or will take that and that will be what kind of redeems her eventually where she she stops being so kind of ornery and actually you know becomes a part of the team but also you know she's just not angry all the time. So that's my own like little prediction for this season. The Walking Dead can't touch an Emmy. They they don't even get nominated. But I'll tell you, God damn, the acting between Norman Reedus and Melissa McBride in that scene when they were talking, I had both. I I was just kind of kind of getting chills with the fact where he's deciding whether he's not going to tell her or not. And just the the I didn't want him to tell her like I, I, I was you know, you could feel the emotion in the room as far as if he tells her this, she's just going to completely lose it. What did you think of that scene, Ig? You know, I, I was split all the way through because I wanted him to tell her because I thought that would bring her back. But in that moment, you saw how broken she was. And if he would have told her, who knows what would have happened? First of all, it would have been an irrational decision out of Carol. And I think that she may have killed herself. She may have just run out and tried to do something and get herself killed, give up her position, give up the kingdom's position, give up anything that could go on just out of anger. Because we know that the no fucks given Carol is the best kind of Carol, but this wouldn't be a no fucks given. This would be an all fucks given Carol. And that might be the worst kind of Carol. So I think saving her and, and stopping giving her all the information that would throw her just right off the deep end eventually was the right decision. I I was initially upset that he was lying and not telling her, but that being said that I think, I think that it worked in that moment. It it just felt like the audience was sitting there in the cabin with them. I I thought it was perfectly acted. I thought it was perfectly performed. I thought uh, uh, the the tone of, and the setting was, uh, it was a hundred percent. It was probably one of my favorite walking dead scenes ever. Ryan, if you were Daryl, would you have told her? It's a tough decision. He, I think he should have, I would have, uh, because she's going to find out eventually. And, you know, I don't, I just don't see the purpose in him lying to her. And she's not the type of person, you know, let's say, he, okay, so let's say in his mind, okay, he's going to lie to her now because he needs to say, spare her feelings and she's too broken. She's not at a point where she can hear it. When 
if and when he tells her, her reaction, she's not going to accept that. She's not the type of person or character to accept, you know, that, oh, I, I need to coddle you because you, you wouldn't be able to handle bad news. So I just don't see... I, it doesn't make sense he didn't tell her one interesting thing my wife mentioned afterwards what if what if he's it's his own resolution like he's he's accepted where she's at and now he's going to go to Richard and say all right let's do this um so she actually had this weird thought that I didn't you know hadn't even considered while it was going on that it was almost him saying you know all right let her have you know let her you know think everything's okay and you know what we've got to go let's let's go do this and and uh you know and, and enact uh, the plan that he had he you know, been get, talking about earlier. When Morgan says that Carol left, he kind of means it, but not in a physical way. The, the, I believe the old Carol is kind of gone. She she really has left. You know, the physical Carol remains, but there's not much of the, the person I think they once knew. So if there was a cool enough place for Daryl to be, because he's the king of doing cool shit, where in the kingdom would he be? In the back, hanging out with Shiva, petting her. Him and Morgan, uh, and he delivers the line of the show. Uh, Morgan kind of uh, comes up and talks to him, and he's any guy with a pet tagger can't be that bad. Leave it to Daryl. He, he's always in the right place at the right time. If there was any place for him to be, that that would be it. Ryan, are you as frustrated as I am with Morgan with his refusal, absolute refusal to help? He 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 just plainly stated it can't be me. Uh I- I I am frustrated with him, but that's, I don't know, it's it's who he is, I guess. I, I've, I've just accepted it. Um, and I, you know, he's formidable and he's tough and he he's skilled, but he's not the, no one person, I guess, is the most important. I guess, you know, he does to an extent, um, you know, I think Ezekiel trusts him. And so having him, you know, having him in his ear would help, but... I'm not, I don't know, I guess I'm just not quite as frustrated because uh, I just don't, I, I wouldn't expect anything less of him. I'm very frustrated with Morgan's uh, refusal to sort of jump up and kind of take the bull by the horns on this one. I feel like um, he will come around, but it's kind of feeling a little ponderous waiting for him to, you know, make that decision. But I understand where he's coming from. He wants the best for everybody and he doesn't want to be impulsive because he knows what the outcome's going to be. But it does feel like it's come on, Morgan. I am frustrated at Morgan, but I might be more frustrated at Daryl at this point because he just said at the end of that conversation that he was leaving and going back to Hilltop. And Rick gave him instructions to stay here and then stare Ezekiel into submission if he needs to. Really, it was thrown on Daryl to make this happen, not Morgan, because Rick already has the impression that Morgan's not going to be the one to make this happen. So Daryl leaving takes another person out of the equation to try and pull Ezekiel into the fold. But Daryl's ability with Shiva makes me want him to stay there even more, and he wants to leave. I mean, that was completely either Crocodile Dundee or Richard Riddick, because, I mean, he was at one with that tiger. And that was pretty cool. Yeah, the reunion with Carol seemed a bit rushed, and his time in Hilt- uh, his time in the kingdom seemed extremely rushed. I-, I thought maybe another episode or two of him being there and working on the king, but you know, The Walking Dead does what The Walking Dead does. What did you think of it, Ryan? I, it kind of started because you know, again, my wife said the thing about about Daryl maybe get, you know joining up with Richard, and initially I thought, oh, that's stupid. That's not going to happen. But that kind of lent a little credence to that idea to me because I don't see there doesn't seem to be a reason for him to go to Hilltop. Um, and he was given instructions by Rick. I, you know, I think he knows he, he's an integral part of whatever, whatever Rick's planning, he's an integral part. So if they have a plan set up and Rick shows up and Daryl's not there, it could screw things up. So I don't, I don't see a reason for him to go to Hilltop, but if he's going to hide out with Richard or hide out in that space and then help him kind of lure, um, the saviors in maybe it, again it lends a little credence to that idea so so i'm i'm kind of with this this idea that he's going to join up with he and richard are gonna you know attack them and then lead them to carol um so i guess we'll see where that goes yeah leaving one community because they're not acting fast enough to go to another community that's definitely not acting at all uh it, it confuses me a little so if him and richard join forces and become like a two-man hit squad and start taking out uh, going out on the saviors that that definitely would make a little more sense Ig, what did you think of the episode and what would you rate it? 
Well, I, I like the episode. Um, I think it drug a little bit at times, but it, it was a very good setup. Uh, I liked it better than last week's episode. Um, I think purely based on the weaponized walker, that, that sold me quite a bit. Um, the green screen killed the score on this for me a little bit because I still can't get by it. Oh, my God. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to rate this one a 7.5. Um, I definitely did like last week's episode. I definitely liked the um, Walker limbo that was happening. And then this week sort of was the antithesis of that with the <laughs> green screen. <laughs> they used their whole budget last week. But um, I definitely think that it was not one of my favorite episodes. And while I liked the weaponized Walker, I'm going with a seven on this episode. So this episode's a lot like last week where... Overall, I was I was still left underwhelmed and wanting more. Um, it did advance the plot to an extent. Uh, in you know, in a way they can't go so they can't move so fast as to be a complete difference from from the beginning of the season. So I get I get the pacing to an extent. Um, I was still underwhelmed, but at the same time, there were some great performances. Um, I forget what's the the leader of the new group. Uh, what's her name? Jadis, I thought she's great. Like I, 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 there were some great moments, even though I was underwhelmed by how they went about Daryl and Carol um, meeting again. You're right. Like the performances were great. So there were some really good performances. Uh, the weaponized Walker uh, was really cool, just like the, uh, you know, the Walker clothesline from last week. So there were some definitely some really you know, great moments and the acting was really good. The performances were really good. So I did like that. Again, I just, something just left underwhelmed by the episode overall. Um, and the green screen definitely brings it down. So I'll give it a seven. Um, I probably would have gone with a 7.5, but that the green screen takes off at least half a point, if not a full point. Cause that just, it shouldn't have been there. If Melissa McBride doesn't get an Emmy at some point, I say we riot. She, Saved the show this week. The uh, the weaponized Walker was very cool. Strong performances from Seth Gillian. I, I would probably give the show uh, between a six or a seven, so probably six and a half. I wanted more out of it. I mean, we got just enough. Uh, the acting saved the visual effects, and the weaponized Walker was cool as hell. So there you go from the Cynic Radio podcast. Episode 10 of The Walking Dead, season seven. New best friends. We're going to give it a seven. Come back next week for the next episode of The Walking Dead. Coming up right now is really. So now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, it's time for really. I'd explain it. Just listen. You'll get it. So my really for this week is about an Oklahoma bill written by Justin Hemphrey. Uh, it's passing through their house and it would require written consent from a father before a woman can have an abortion. Um, I'm going to quote some of the language of this. It says to provide in writing the identity of the father of the fetus to the physician who is to perform or induce the abortion. If the person identified as the father of the fetus challenges the fact that he is the father, such individual may demand that a paternity test be performed. So, like, this is just ridiculous. Uh, it's another example of men trying to legislate women, the women's use of their bodies. Um, and there's just so many things that are wrong with with this bill and with with this idea that, you know, we need to still police this. Um, even if in this in this bill itself... It's saying a she needs consent and b once she finds the guy she can he can then re request a paternity test and it's it's just ridiculous like you know at the end of the day no matter where you stand uh, you know on 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 the line of whether or not you're pro choice or pro life like this this is a battle that's over um it's it's been over for a long time you know not only did the supreme court uphold you know uphold it and with roe v wade but you know even in 1992 the supreme court struck down a very similar law requiring consent from the father so i just don't understand this constant you know there these constant efforts to try to suppress women it just doesn't make sense and in this day and age like again whether or not no matter where you fall you know on the political side of this like it, it it's done it, it's a battle that's that's over and and women do and in my opinion should have the right to choose but to constantly try to find ways around it is just appalling and um you know this bill just to me is asinine and you know i'll give you, you know, just the language of the bill itself and even the author who 
at some point um, in speaking referred to women as hosts. So beneath even being a human being, they're just hosts to carry these these, these children. Um, you know, there's a great article about this um, in the Washington Post where you can get a little bit more of the details. But but it's it's just ridiculous. And you know, to to anyone at this stage who who sees this law as being you know appropriate, um, you know, really. Hey guys, my really this week is for the anonymous buyer on eBay of the flaming hot Cheeto that appeared to be in the shape of Harambe, the gorilla who was killed at the Cincinnati Zoo last year after a child wandered into his pit at the zoo. Huh. I guess the real story here is not that there is a Cheeto that appears to look like Harambe. The story here is that someone actually bid on this for $100,000, which, no surprise here, won the auction. I mean, which question is first? A, who examines their Cheetos that close when they're eating them? I mean... Those suckers are going in my mouth pretty quick. I don't know about you, but I'm not trying to decipher what different shapes they may be in. B, at what point did this person think, hey, this looks like a Harambe Cheeto? Light bulb, let's sell this on eBay. And C, who the fuck else was crazy enough to think they needed to get into a bidding war that made the final bid $100,000 for a Cheeto? Who has that kind of money? Clearly an eccentric billionaire that has no doubt the toast that has the face of Jesus on it. It's thoroughly discombobulating to me that anyone has this money to spend like this. And really, it's just very sad. So... Really? Flaming hot Cheeto Harambe buyer? Really for me this week comes from Washington Dulles International Airport in Washington, D.C. Customs and Border Patrol officials at Washington Dulles stopped two women traveling from Mongolia as part of a routine agriculture inspection and seized 42 pounds of horse meat and three liters of yak milk. Of the 42 pounds of horse meat, 13 pounds were horse genitals. I got nothing. That's strange. Thankfully, the stuff was all seized and the products were incinerated. Really? Really for me this week is the poor lost souls who have the inability to intelligently listen to others with opposing political views. We'd much rather label them, shut down the conversation altogether, and get angry at them. It boggles my mind that we show the complete disregard for other people's opinion because they're not like our own. And we're unwilling to keep an open mind to the fact that our side isn't always right. One of the biggest knocks I hear repeatedly about immigrants is they come here and they don't want to become Americans. But at the end of the day, are we? Your political affiliation doesn't define you, and it shouldn't. We should always question the government, and we should stop being puppets. I beg you, wake up before it's too late. We're Americans. We're not Democrats. We're not Republicans. And oh, by the way, free speech doesn't only apply to the things that you want to hear. So to all you close-minded, mad-as-hell... Facebook political analysts. Really? And that's going to do it for episode 19 of the Cynic Radio Podcast. I'm Igrahi. With me, as always, has been the only man alive with a Hot Topic credit card, my co-host, Cynic. Joining us this week has been Jules, the, the one lady I know that believes that global warming is a hoax, and Ryan George from the Jim Wits Podcast. You can find them over at jimwits.com. Send us your comments, questions, concerns, and all of the lunch cobbler you can come across to cynicradio.com. Send us an email at cynicradio at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cynicradio. And find us on Twitter at cynicradio. We had a great time talking to you. We'll be back next week with all new content. And until next time, don't get captured. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and at cynicradio.com. Available for download on iTunes. 